All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our very special event with author Kate Reculia. My name is Kim Havens. I'm the event manager here at An Unlikely Story, currently in our lovely event space that is very quiet. I can't wait to welcome you all back into our bookstore. I have a few housekeeping items before we start. If you lose your connection or video or your sound, just quit right out of the browser, jump right back in, and um, you'll be all set to go. So if you have questions for Kate, you can type them in the Ask a Question box. It's right at the bottom of your screen. And you can also upvote questions that someone else has asked and the most popular ones float to the top. So it's kind of cool. We do have a link on below so you can purchase a copy of Tuesday Mooney Talks to Ghosts. You have to have it. And Kate has kindly signed book plates for us so you will get a signed book plate along with your book. Kate Reculia is a novelist joining us from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where she lives with her two adorable cats. She's the author of the novels, This Must Be the Place and Bellwether Rhapsody, which was the winner of the American Library Association's Alex Award. Her third novel, Tuesday Mooning Talks to Ghosts, was just recently reduced in paperback. I love this bio. I got it from her website. Kate was a teenage bassoonist in her hometown of Syracuse and studied illustration, design, Jane Austen, and Canada at the University of Buffalo. She's been a cartoonist, a planetarium operator, a movie and music reviewer, a coffee jerk, a bookseller, a designer, a finance marketing proposal writer, and a fundraising prospect researcher. <clears throat> I love all the things that all us book loving people have done. My list is equally hilarious. Mm -hmm. She teaches online for Grub Street, works at her local public library, and sings in the oldest Bach choir in America. Tuesday Mooney Talks to Ghosts is my very favorite kind of novel with quirky, prickly characters you'll fall in love with, a mysterious quest, and best of all, ghosts. So I read a galley of it. This is my original galley from long ago before it came out in October 2019. And I just loved it. I, obviously, I still have my galley. Mm -hmm. I reread it ahead of the event. And I love it even more now as I discovered it's the perfect escape novel for those of us feeling a little cooped up. So as this story is, a very wealthy collector of haunted objects extends an invitation to all of those reading his obituary in the Boston Globe to play a game an adventure of intellect, intuition, and imagination that culminates at a funeral mask on the night of his funeral. Tuesday and her friends chase clues all over Boston, including my dream brunch with a Bloody Mary bar with Lila, Vincent Price's widow. It's about friendship, grief, and really is a love letter to Boston. Kate moved to Boston to get her MFA from Emerson College, and she stayed for 11 years. And her version of the city, as she writes it in Tuesday Mooney, is an absolute delight. <laughs> Joining Kate this evening is Margaret H. Willison at Miss Friday Next, which I keep wanting to call Tuesday, Tuesday Next. <laughs> Sparkling internet personality who's a regular fourth chair on NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour podcast and one half of the popular and delightful Two Bossy Dames newsletter. In her ample spare time, Margaret is also a librarian at MIT and continues her quest to befriend every dog in New England. And it sounds like she is hanging out with one of the best dogs in New England right at this moment. Maybe we will see him. So it is my absolute distinct pleasure to welcome Kate Reculia and Margaret Willison. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It was Thank fantastic. You. Thank you. Yeah, I feel very flattered. <laughs> you're, you're right. I feel like, should I get played down the stage? I always want to do like, like elevator up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like something to just like come into frame. Exactly. You can do one of those things where you're like walking up an escalator. Yes. You just gotta, you gotta think it through, Kate. Okay? You just gotta prepare yourself. <laughs> it was very funny when uh, we were just being introduced. When you lived in Boston, had we ever met? Uh, we did not meet until I left Boston. We did not meet until you left Boston. We've been friends for yep. years. And in the middle of a snowstorm on a whim, I checked uh, Bellwether Rhapsody out from like the online library at the BPL, which <laughs> oh, BPL. It's, it's, it's regularly available in Hoopla. And so I just recommend if you are home and uh, looking for something to do, and you don't feel like buying the book, which you certainly should do, you can really <laughs> frequently check it out of the library online. So I did that. And then I think I pretty rapidly started screenshotting new passages that felt like personal attacks. 
Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Personal attacks. Yeah, I had never met you. Um, and you were like, this character of Alice Hatmaker is... It's like, I don't know why you wrote about me. Yes. <laughs> very rude. <laughs> it was very, it was psychic connection. But yeah, I first met you. I mean, it's proof that Twitter can be a raging garbage fire. But like, I've met many wonderful people I consider IRL in real life yes. friends. Um, well, we're, we're friends in real life now. Exactly. exactly. So... Uh, but yeah, so we've, I, we've crossed the veil. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I went to an event at Tumblr for Rainbow Rowell. Yes. And I, I don't think I realized that you were there until all of a sudden I was like, oh, it, it was your style. You had very, <laughs> like, like very kind of colorful, um, chic library style. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's Mrs. Friday next. And there we go. We met in person. But yeah, I, my cardigans. I was in Boston at that point. And I had, I was starting to write Tuesday Mooney that... Mm. Oh, during that time when I was going through my Boston grief. <laughs> Which is an understandable. I mean, like, what a beautiful way to process missing the city because you do such a vivid job of recreating it. I see that we've got a number of people who are in the chat who are here from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And so I would just say to you folks, if you haven't read the book yet, um, it does such a good job of, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, 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 that's the book. <laughs> if you're familiar. Um, it does such a wonderful job of evoking the city. And I was sort of curious, uh, in the process of designing this scavenger hunt, hmm. you come up with a bunch of really interesting pieces of information about Boston and really cool places. What were the places you came up with that you couldn't use oh. <laughs> in the scavenger hunt? Because I'm sure there must have been a million. I mean... Well, this is just like a little, <laughs> it wasn't even part of the scavenger hunt. Early drafts of this book, just like Tuesday got a lot more takeout with a lot more readers. <laughs> and I had friends read it. One friend in particular who was like, we don't need all of your takeout orders that you missed getting. Like that is not important to the story. And I was like, I know. <laughs> She's like, you don't need to be fanfic about your life. I'm like, it's fanfic. If you wanted to release a special annotated version with like <laughs> all of the takeout orders, I would be extremely interested. Um, well, the original, the original third act did not take place. Um, I read the original third you act. You did read the original third act. I you think you read the like first one that's like real crazy that takes place. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't have the, had the, the, the platforms that went up and down. Yeah, yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. No, it was kind of like, there was almost like a, it wasn't Jeopardy, but it was like a quiz game with like, <laughs> platforms and a house in Nantucket and it was the whole thing. So I guess like getting, you know, that kind of Nantucket Island Martha's Vineyard experience, which was a big part of, and going down to the Cape, right? Which that sure. was a big part of what I loved about living in Boston. But then I just, you know, and this is like a writing thing, right? I find that sometimes I, when I've written something or when I'm writing something, I have these ideas in my head about what I need to do. And then I forget that I can change them. <laughs> like, the ideas are not, permanent right and so I was I really had to sort of sit back and think and I was like well Vincent Price the guy who designs this puzzle this scavenger hunt mm -hmm. would want as many people to play it as humanly possible right and it is a pain in the butt to get down the cape and get he would not do that it would be an impediment to people playing the game so it's now very astute. yeah so now so now it's not there but yeah having that be a part of it was something that I didn't um, yeah, another version of this would literally just have been like every place I sang karaoke. There'd be a lot of sake <laughs> from the Vulcan. Um, it would be a lot of Kate's Inside Baseball of Boston, which is mostly, oh, there, there was also a scene at the Brattle Bookshop. Sure. I mean, which is a classic, a classic one yep. to have picked. Um, okay, you mentioned karaoke, and in the book, <laughs> one of your characters, Dex, another personal attack on me, very rude. <laughs> Kate has this knack for writing, um, like, repressed theater kids. <laughs> yep, yep. And, well, actually, I guess in Bellwether, you wrote actual theater kids. And in this, you have a repressed theater kid. And mm -hmm. Bellwether, I was like, oh, God, I, it's very uncomfortable to look at my 16-year-old self right in the eyes. I don't, I don't prefer this. And then here, I was like, looking at my 32-year-old self right in the eyes, not much better. <laughs> Thank you. But... Next, Point Dexter Howard, he's mm -hmm. an absolute delight. Thank you. Uh, repressed theater kid who's become a, by, through through student loan pressure and bad slash good luck, a Boston financial bro. 
Yes. Um, <laughs> and he just desperately, he has to, he has to keep himself from cross-dressing and drinking at his very conservative hedge fund during yeah. the work day. Yeah. He's yeah. that kind of person. And what he likes to do is play um, karaoke uh, roulette. <laughs> And what I wanted to know is, have you ever played karaoke roulette? And can you tell the folks what it is? <laughs> okay. So what karaoke roulette is, is karaoke, but the roulette portion, and this is sort of, the book is set in 2012, um, which we can talk about the reasons for that later, but it's set in 2012. So it's it's sort of an older version of, um, <laughs> Of, of music service and what would be on your iPod or iPhone. Mm -hmm. So there's like a like a shuffle feature. You you choose whatever your karaoke song is going to be, and then you mm -hmm. put your iPod or your um, iPhone on shuffle, and whatever song comes up, you have to sing your karaoke song in the style of that song. <laughs> so you know you could have picked um, uh, like I think one of the ones that I talk about in the book is uh, Rage Against the Machine, Killing in the Name of, but in the style of Barbara Streisand. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> so I actually, I have never personally played karaoke roulette and the way mm -hmm. that this book is both fanfic and wish fulfillment sort of mm -hmm. like, like there's a scene where they go down in Park Street, which is one of the tea stations in Boston. It's objectively completely. One of the perfect. oldest, I think the oldest tea station in America. Oh, excuse me, I should say the oldest subway station in America. Yes. Because outside of Boston, you don't call it the tea. No, but it's a tea. It's a tea. It's a tea. <laughs> um, I never like scampered around in the tunnels there and like looked at, look, I never did that in real life. But of course, every time I like drove or like, I, the, know. I would push my face to the window to look and see what was there. What so, I wish you had included is the secret platform. The you know, outside of Harvard's where there's like the platform, there's like the ghost of the old platform. Yeah, it's that is, Margaret, that is literally why that scene is in there because <laughs> we work at Curious George Goes to Wordsworth. We both work at Curious George Goes to Wordsworth, but years apart, years apart. So, <laughs> tragically. And there was one, so my coworker, Gina, who is a lovely human being, and I we follow each other on Twitter, one time on our lunch break, she was like, did you know you can see there's a ghost on the old Harvard platform? And we <laughs> like rode to MIT from Harvard and back trying to see the ghost. And you see, can see the old platform, but there was no yeah. <laughs> The old platform is pretty spooky, though. It's very spooky. It's very spooky. So that kind of like, so in, in the way that like, I've never played karaoke roulette because I don't have that much confidence in my singing abilities. Sure, sure. <laughs> but like, but I would like to. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's also, this book was a way for me to like, do all of the scampering around Boston that mm -hmm. I was a little too chicken slash law abiding to do. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Um, I do have a list of songs, and mm -hmm. I want you to tell me the karaoke style you would want to hear Poindexter Howard perform yes. them in. Yes, yes. So, uh, first up, we have Toxic by Britney Spears. Oh, um, Celine Dion. I love it. I love it. <laughs> There'd be a lot of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. That would be right. incredible. <laughs> um, okay, great. This okay. is going exactly as well as I was hoping. Yep. Uh, item number two, mm -hmm. we have Paradise by the Dashboard Light by Meatloaf in the style of whom, Kate, who would it be in the style of? How about Lou Reed? <laughs> Lou Reed. <laughs> it was like a half an hour. <laughs> I feel like your answers are either like Lou Reed or Serge Gainborg. Like those are the only two that would work. <laughs> it's the only kind of paradise by the dashboard light that I want to see in the world. All right, all right. Um, we've got uh, Tub Something by Chumbawamba. Who's going to, in the style of whom? Oh, oh no. Gregorian chants like monks. <laughs> yes. yes. I don't know if it's a thing in like a, like a multiple part harmony, but I feel like you could embody a Gregorian monk. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next up. Yep. Bitch by Meredith Brooks. Oh. Hmm. It's tricky. This is a tricky one. Hmm. I kind of want to say something. And I honestly feel like this is something <laughs> that I already did once in the book and got away with. But like <laughs> John Denver and the Muppets, like I feel like it's like a Muppet <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah, a Muppety yeah. thing would be or really like cool. Piggy. I feel like Miss Piggy could really embody that. Yes. Oh my God, Miss Piggy mm -hmm. would crush bitch at karaoke. I love it. That's absolutely the right answer. <laughs> um, and our final one is um, Total Eclipse of the Heart by Bonnie Tyler in the style oh. of whom? 
I mean, at style of Bonnie Tyler, he would think that that was sacrilege. <laughs> That's so beautiful. What a beautiful note upon which to end. Yep. yep. He would be like, I can't, I can't. It's perfect. Nothing <laughs> So you mentioned that this story is set in 2012 and for a particular yeah. reason. Would you like to elaborate? Yes. So uh, a couple of reasons. I wanted, so I left Boston in 2014. So I definitely wanted to set the story since I would be writing about my Boston. I haven't gone, you know, for six years. My Boston is, there's a lot of it that's still there, but a lot of the very particular quirks and places I got takeout from are gone. And Especially I'm, in the last eight months. Seriously. I, it's just heartbreaking on every single possible level. Yeah. So I knew I wanted it to be a very particular moment in time of my Boston. Um, but the marathon bombing happened in 2013, which is when oh, okay. I that. And I was like, there's no way people would be sort of this cavalier about scampering out the city and like messing with stuff and like like the the joke I make about the Moominite panic. <laughs> Which is my panic. What a vivid moment in time. <laughs> is my vivid, my deepest Boston cut, which is the <laughs> sidebar. Um, mm -hmm. What was that, like 2007, 2006? It was something? definitely 2007 because it was when I was still in college. Okay. I was witnessing the Moon Night panic remotely. It was, remotely. It was spring of 2007 of my senior year. Yep. So the Moon Nights are like these little critters from a, a cartoon on Adult Swim. And as like a guerrilla marketing campaign, they made little light brights of these Moominites and put them up under bridges all over Boston. And Boston like shut down for a day because no one in the bomb squad recognized these little cartoon characters and that it was viral marketing. Why so, would they? Why would they? <laughs> <laughs> so, so like the reference to that, but like no one would have, t no one, it was just a very different attitude in Boston. Mm -hmm. No, and cops I, are I, by and large non-swimming adults. No, they're not. not they're just, no. So, so I had to set it in 2012. And then I also, in my original conceptions of it, it was going to be a trilogy. And I wanted to write about how it felt to be. Does that mean it's not going to be a trilogy? Because I would really like there to be sequels. I mean, I mean, it's I haven't written anything yet, but I have sketched out plans. And the second one would be set in 2013 and would kind of address that. I and just mean, like, who should I send stuffed ravens to? That's my question. <laughs> just like, like a whole, like, like a whole box of them. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you could As send a campaign. It, I guess you could send it to Hode Mifflin, her court. Okay, <laughs> um, folks, send raven feathers to Hote Mifflin, her court. So there's going to be more of these <laughs> books. Demanding. I really want Demanding more. more books. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to write about it because I felt like it was really, it obviously was a horrible, tragic, awful time. Yeah. Um, but I also saw people being outrageously generous to each other, like every day, you know, and, yeah. and I saw that because I was on the ground in Boston. If you watch the news, it was just like everyone panicking and freaking out, but like people on the ground were taking care of each other. And that's something, you know, obviously these books are very silly, but I also, I <laughs> try to sneak in something. Pardon me, ma'am. <laughs> Pardon me. These books are diverting and engrossing and charming. I would not call them silly. Or light. I wouldn't even necessarily call them light. They I are, them light. They are all of the adjectives I just used, and I'm a professional describer. So, <laughs> thank you, Margaret. No, it's true. I mean, I, I, my my friend Jason said to me years and years ago. He's I like, think he's someone... here, Jason Clark. Yeah, Jason. Hi, Jason. Hey, Jason. <laughs> Hi, I'm about to quote you. Um, he said, "Howdy, Kate." So, <laughs> years and years ago, said, "Wow, for someone who's like so, like." Uh, cheerful and upbeat you write a lot about death <laughs> like, yeah I, I do i do i always write i'm always writing about death i'm always writing about loss and grief and mm -hmm. and and i think that the only way i know how to do that truthfully is also to be very light so you have the balance of both sides yeah you guys um in the intro it was mentioned that bellwether rhapsody won my favorite book award which is the alex award from the ala which is given to adult books with quote unquote high teen appeal, <laughs> AKA adult <laughs> books I'll actually enjoy reading. <laughs> and um, what I think uh, that actually means is it's books where there isn't a sense, like you can deal with heavy things, you can mm -hmm. deal with a full range of human emotion, but there's never a sense that it doesn't mean anything, yeah. right? There's never a sense of uh, like Nietzschean hopelessness, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just so, so I think your books are wonderful because they do deal with this full spectrum of emotion and like trauma frequently is encountered really head on. Yeah. But it's in a space where it's like 
I'm not just going to be exposed to this trauma. And then at the end, it's going to be like, yes, because life is suffering. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I, think I got that, you know, from a lot of people that I read as a young person, but I think I really got that from reading Stephen King as a young person. Cause like, uh -huh awful stuff happens in many, many Stephen King books. Like True. not everyone literally makes that alive, mm -hmm. but he has a sort of abiding hope in humans, <laughs> some kind of cosmic balance, you know, for better or for worse. And and I just really, I took that in really deep as a young person that like, life is not easy. You will suffer. You will not be able to change you and it will change the people that you love and care about, um, but you'll get through it somehow. Yeah, and I don't even think it means you need to have faith that people are good. I think you yeah. just need to have faith that the actions you take matter. Yeah. yeah. Right? That mm -hmm. it is just it is just what you do in the world has weight and moral yeah. consequences. Yes, absolutely. That, that is what I need in books, and that is what can be very hard to find sometimes in literary fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. For adults. <laughs> Excuse me, because there is lots of literary fiction published under the designation of YA that is still has this sense of like the actions that you take matter and like there is a moral value to the yes. to the things we do in the universe. And, and, and you are not allowed to morally tap out. Like right. so, yes. It's much right. easier to be cynical. <laughs> much, much easier to be mm -hmm. cynical. And I think that's one of the really interesting journeys that sort of gets dramatized in this book, mm -hmm. is we sort of get to watch Tuesday move from detached cynic mm -hmm. to uh, understanding how connected that she is to the world. I guess, what attracted you to that story? I mean, I think uh, that is in many ways, I am a loner. I don't think I'm a cynical person. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think I'm kind of an optimist realist, or at least I try to be, but I am definitely a loner. And I definitely mm -hmm. are like, I can do it alone. I hate group work. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> so, so that kind of like self-imposed, shut it down, like I got it all handled. That's very much me and me kind mm -hmm. of writing through the fact that life again and again has taught me that, A, you just don't need to do that to yourself. B, right. life is much better if you like let people in and and you know kind of give up some of your like control to just sort of experience more and and be more of a part of a community so that that came from that but it also kind of came from you know i say this is my, my indiana jones story but it's also like my sherlock holmes story like sure he, he is a sherlock in in all of his sort of self-destructive ways but I wanted her to have sort of like a healthier community and like Texas or Watson, of course, like obviously, obviously, but he's much smarter than Watson, much smarter than Watson. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's much more Poor Watson, <laughs> Poor Watson. But yeah, I, th I think that, you know, kind of the rigid uh, brainy hero realizing they don't have to do it alone story is something that I've always been drawn to because of, of the ways, and I'm an only child, the ways that I, you know, kind of have learned that in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that touches on another, like this and the Stephen King question, touch on another thing mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you about with regards to your writing, which is um, what I've said about your books, and this is slightly more of a, more of a comment, less of a question, but I'm going to get to the question. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I'm allowed to do it. I'm the event moderator. <laughs> you people in the chat, I won't, I won't truck with it. Anyways, <laughs> event moderator here. Um, what I've observed about your books is that they do a really remarkable job of like the, the influences are really clear and mm -hmm. like top notes you can very easily say like if you love the Westing game, right. like you'll love Kate Reculia's books. <laughs> um, uh, but they are wholly themselves, mm -hmm. right? They are not some like weird mishmash of references. They are complete and fleshed out and thorough and delightful in their own way. So like, even if you had no connection to the Westing game, mm -hmm. you would still love these books. Um, and I guess what I'm curious about is sort of like, how do you approach the process of like, what, what is an influence for you? Mm -hmm. And how do you approach how you bring those influences into your work without letting them consume your work? That's a really good question. Um, Thank you. <laughs> good comment. Excellent question. <laughs> I think in some ways, I I've always been 
omnivorous in the stuff that I'm interested in. I've always yeah. loved genre stuff. I feel very lucky in that I've never felt shamed necessarily, or like I couldn't love Mary Higgins Clark <laughs> or like that that wasn't reading. Like, right, right. Thanks parents for never shaming me for my reading taste. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. <laughs> in the chat. <laughs> That's my mom, my mom's here. Um, and my dad, yeah. my dad's here too. Um, so where was it going with this? Oh, anyway, so, and I think I'm very drawn to genre sort of types, right? And, and I think a lot of the genre types that I'm drawn to, mystery, um, uh, adventure, ghost story, horror, um, especially kind of thinking adventure um, and mystery, which are sort of like Bellwether. Bellwether is more like mystery horror and Tuesday Mooney is more mystery adventure. They have very male protagonists. So I think in the way that I, oh, I think Margaret, did you freeze? We froze. Okay. There was there was freezing, but I think we're both back now. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so I yes. think this, by the very sort of like me trying to write my, I mean, I'm not writing myself. Like I, I know that that's a thing that especially a lot of women authors get assumed. Like, oh, you're writing parts of your life. Literally, everyone is writing parts of their life, <laughs> regardless of their gender. When right. So, but like by me sort of putting some of my um, interests into it. I'm always looking for something to add something to it that wasn't there in what I got. I'm not looking to replicate something. I'm kind of looking to flip something that's in a genre or like make something more capacious or make something more modern or make something, you know, and this is something I learned from Agatha Christie, make something that is the opposite of what you think it's going to be based on everything else you've ever read. <laughs> right. Which is why, even though I genuinely, like I, I, I respect all of the people mm -hmm. who love the Goonies. Mm -hmm. Nothing but respect in my heart for you. If I, if I, I saw that movie too grown up, and too I was like, like, "This is garbage." Yep. No, I literally, Margaret. This is also my Goonies novel. Like, <laughs> I know, I know it is, Kate. I know it is. <laughs> but yeah, I got that. I got Goonies at the age of like six or seven, and it just Which is perfect. Like, it was perfect. And even like Martha Plimpton in that is almost, I looked like that as a young person. <laughs> um, so I was like between her and Barb and Stranger Things was Kate Ricoglia as a young person. <laughs> but definitely showing it to friends in college, they're like, this is a movie full of screaming children. Like what is happening? <laughs> I do love that you mentioned Stranger Things because I would say Stranger Things is a piece of art that is referential and it is consumed by its references. Yes. Right? It is not doing enough to innovate beyond its references, as we talked about at length with regards to Barb on my TV podcast. Yes, yes. Appointment television. Check it out. It's delightful. But yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's acceptable. You're not going to take the thing that you loved or the references and recombine them in a cool way or critique them in that sort of spirit of like, yes, critique the things you love. Like, right. write something else. Write yourself into it. Write other people into it. Um, then kind of if all you're going to do is be like, remember when? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then you're just a busty article. You're just yes. a busty article with a big budget. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you, are, you are the Netflix version of a listicle. That's all you are. <laughs> and, and look, sometimes I love a listicle. Sure. Not, I don't. But there's a very real reason why I watched the first season of Stranger Things three times and every subsequent season like once. <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh wow, this is great. Oh no. Oh no, it's not though. It's not. It's, it's, it is, it's butt is not going to cash the check that it wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something I always worry about. I want I want my my butt to cash those checks, man. <laughs> As Your butt cashes checks like a fucking pro. Oh my god, I probably shouldn't have sworn. That was probably that was probably very unprofessional of me. I'm so sorry. I will try to do better. FC um, coming down. FCC's coming down on an unlikely story. The most unlikely story. <laughs> Anyways, uh, quickly, I was going to ask you, you actually worked as a prospect researcher, which is what Tuesday does in the book. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, at what point did you realize the fictional potential for that job? And could you explain to the people who haven't read the book yes. what that what that entails? So prospect research, so all the jobs, all the grown-up jobs that everyone has in this book, I have essentially had. I was not a finance bro, but I was like in the land of finance finance bros. I was a marketing information analyst, and then I forget what my other title was. But basically, I wrote <laughs> proposals and finance, and it was it was a time. <laughs> um, but then I was a prospect researcher, which is a sort of um, support role in fundraising. 
Um, prospect researchers are the people behind the scenes who have access to all of the glorious publicly available information about foundations, real estate, stock transactions, insider trading, um, gossip columns, who's who, all that stuff. Um, and they do, uh, make dossiers and profiles on wealthy people or donors to institutions. So I worked for Massachusetts General Hospital. I was a prospect researcher for them for four years. It was my favorite grown-up job I have ever had. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, I worked with an incredible team of people. It was um, super interesting, super uh, autonomous and self-directed. It was like complete Kate catnip. Like Kate can like not talk to people and like find out about, uh, find find out all day long about really interesting like rich people. Like, yeah. yeah. I gotta say, Kate, that if there's ever a time where you want to leave all of your jobs and writing and, or, or, and just like start a company. Mm -hmm. I feel like we could be both halves of a fundraising company. Like you, you really could do all of the prospect research and then I could go out and con them in person. Exactly. You just go you out just be like, like a, like a, like, like, what is it? Gun for hire? <laughs> you could be like gun for hire fundraising team. <laughs> we would just like, we'd be, we just like sweep in. And sweep exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so that's what I did. I loved it. And it was just, you know, you know, speaking of like your actions matter, I, I was such a huge cog in that giant finance machine. I worked in mm -hmm. finance around 2008. I was like, what am I doing here? And like, there are many things to critique about the way that like big philanthropy works in America, for sure. Sure. Oh boy. Well, on, on as balance, a former employee of MIT, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> on balance though, like I felt like I was, I was less of a part of the problem when I worked in fundraising than when I worked in finance. Much as there is no there's no just consumption under capitalism. There is no just career under capitalism either. Right? You're either directly working to enrich billionaires or, or you're, you're working in industries yeah. reliant on the largesse of billionaires. Like those are our options. That's all we've got. So, but it was, so anyway, so that's the job. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized it had fictional potential when I was talking to my editor on Bellwether Rhapsody, Andrea Schultz, who is wonderful. She is at Viking now? I believe she's a Viking. Mm -hmm. um, and she she was like, oh, what do you do? What's your day job? And I told her, and she was like, that is an incredible job for an amateur detective. And I oh, like, true. You are not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> You're so, like, thank you, Andrea. <laughs> yeah, so that was when I first kind of got the idea. Plus, like, I'd spent four years learning about wealthy people, and I right. had a lot of thoughts and feelings about wealth and money and what it means to be generous. Um, and, and I mean, it was my processing Boston novel. I had left Boston. I really wanted to just sort of live in that space for a while and kind of make sense of it for myself. Like a lot of times I write to make sense of the world and my life and, and all of this. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where that came about. It's a great job. I love it. Or I loved it. <laughs> we have, it looks like some questions. I'm just going to check in on them. Okay. Um, oh, someone says, uh, were we separated at birth? Because <laughs> um, they can see we get along. Yes. Uh, that is the best question ever. I love it. <laughs> we were not separated at birth, but I will say, um, Kate looks exactly like my friend, Catherine Van Arendonk, who's one of the hosts of my TV podcasts, such that I have a picture of the two of them looking identical next to each other. It's, it's something else. It's something else. We have eerily similar, like, life stories. I'm like... I'm I'm a little older than Catherine, right? Yeah, so I, I'm like I'm like shifted. <laughs> <laughs> Would you did you play the MIT Mystery Hunt when you were in Boston? No, I never did. I never did. Uh, can you can you tell the other people in the chat what the MIT Mystery Hunt is and why it might oh. be pertinent to the novel? So you may actually know more about it than I did. I just knew it was Here. a thing that existed. And is this where like smoots came from, or is that no? I think the smoots okay. are amazingly entirely separate. I'm shocked that they didn't come up in the story. Um, so the MIT Mystery Hunt is this giant nerd fest scavenger hunt that happens every, I think, January at MIT. Uh, they just, they, whichever team wins the year before designs the year subsequent and there are themes and you do all kinds of math and logic puzzles and it's wild. And Smoots, for those who don't know, is uh, there was a fraternity at MIT and on a whim, they decided to <laughs> measure out the Mass Ave Bridge, which goes across Charles River from Cambridge to Boston. 
they took one of their freshmen, Oliver Smoot, and they laid him down end to end across the bridge and they just marked it out in Smoots. Yep. So, oh, I bet Jacqueline is um, one of my coworkers from the MIT libraries. Yep. Who is also an MIT grad who says Smoots is from a fraternity. She's correct. <laughs> Oliver. So, um, <laughs> but what's important to know about Smoots is not merely that fraternities got into some shenanigans, but then that Boston and Cambridge decided together that they were going to honor this. And so if you get into an accident on the Mass Ave Bridge, it is actually marked down, like the location of the accident is marked in smoots. It's like, it's like 14 and a half smoots onto the Mass Ave Bridge. Like there was a collision between a Toyota Camry and a, and a, I don't know, a Saab. <laughs> Every, every town is weird, but Boston is real weird, man. It's true. <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> one of my questions relates to that. Oh, and there's someone great here who asked about the uh, link between Tuesday Mooney and Bellwether, which is something I am going to circle back to. Yep. Um, but speaking to uh, Boston and how weird it is, if you were to write more books in this theme, would they be further examinations of Boston or would you delve into other cities weird nonsense they they would be boston they would, they be, boston. would be boston okay because yep. yep. i do just want to put out there that philadelphia <laughs> has a lot to offer in this space <laughs> it really does it really does philadelphia has the muter museum which is a museum a, a 19th century medical oddities collection it, it's did you ever want to see the biggest lower intestine you've ever seen in your life because it's massive that's real big <laughs> So big. And like that's that's well known. Like who doesn't know about the Muter Museum, right? Mm -hmm. yep. What's less well known is that the Philadelphia Free Library has Charles Dickens stuffed pet the stuffed corpse of Charles Dickens' pet Raven. Yep. Grip the Knowing, <laughs> which inspired the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. So I'm just saying it would be a very natural jumping off point. I guess maybe if you want to branch out further from the original you know, trilogy you've got imagined. That's a great idea. Into a sex tech. I imagine <laughs> that the third the second book, in the if you follow the Indiana Jones scheme, schema, uh, mm -hmm. it needs to take place sort of in like one location over over like a short period of time. So that would be someplace in Boston over a short period of time. And then the third one could be a little more like, like there could be a little like car and a red line that moves from <laughs> where Boston. I love it. Um, I believe, so someone in the chat volunteered the following information about Oliver Smoot, which I do have to yes. share, which is, do you know what Oliver Smoot did after he graduated? No. He became, According to comment, the director of the Department of Weights and Measures for the U.S. government. You know, truth right? exclamation point. I, I believe I, it. I believe it because that is just like that's harmonic convergence right there. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and this has been confirmed by Jacqueline, who is indeed my MIT graduate friend from the Thanks. MIT libraries. <laughs> so, um, we are not separated at birth. We are friends. You are correct, Gail. Good yeah. call. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to talk to you about um, the specifically the incorporation of there is a character in this book who appeared in Bellwether Rhapsody. Yes. And um, what was your thought process on on how that all happened? So that happened. All right. So when I moved from Boston to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, I was working on this massive gargantuan book that I was like, it's like the Godfather meets Back to the Future. <laughs> what am I smoking? I don't know. So, but it was, it was a, a family saga, but it moved around in time. And there was a, um, there was a, a part that took place in Boston. And there was another part where like this character, I, I just wanted to know how he grew up. I wanted to know what his deal was. Mm -hmm. And so I really liked writing about him. So that book eventually got put aside and it's sort of become my friendship bread manuscript where like, it's just quietly like, or it's like, a, it's like a sourdough starter. It's quietly in the corner and every once in a while I just go in there and take a little bit and I make another book out of it. <laughs> Tuesday was a, was a, <laughs> she was a minor character in the Boston section. She's completely different in her own book, but I just sort mm -hmm. of like whoop, airlifted her out and wrote the book. Mm -hmm. And But I remembered how much I had enjoyed in that draft writing about this other character as a grown up. And I just wanted them to like be in Boston in the years since I was in Boston. Like mm -hmm. it just seemed right that that is where this person would go. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just like, I wanted, 
I wanted um, A, to write about this person again, B, to sort of open the door for writing about this person's sibling again. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I think I may, maybe I get this from Stephen King too. I, when I go to like a flow state, it feels like the same place. Technically, my first book, This Must Be the Place, is also connected to all these books in just a very sort of like minor way, but like it's all in world. So th even though they are slightly different tonally, like I, in my brain, they all feel like they're the same place. So well, now I have an extremely important question. Are yeah. they part of the Tommy Westfall universe? Are they part of the what? The Tommy Westfall universe. Do you know the Tommy Westfall universe? No. What? Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm going to blow your mind, Kate. I'm so excited that I get to be the person to tell you. What's happening? This. Okay. So at the end of St. Elsewhere, famously, okay. yes. uh, like the final episode, the, the, they, yeah. it zooms out and like all of the characters are just inside a snow globe yeah. held by like, I think a kid who has Down syndrome. And his name is Tommy Westfall. And the thing is, is there were crossovers between St. Elsewhere and other TV shows, oh, right? And then there are crossovers between those shows and other TV shows. So there are all of these TV shows that we know to be contained within the Tommy Westfall universe. And sometimes like fake brands pop up from various different places. It's this wild it developed is. thing that is all completely subterranean, which seems like Verculia bait, if yeah. I dare say so. I mean, it is, it is like, and that's, that's how I think of it. They are all connected in like a low key way. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's canon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, you continued writing these books. Yes. Would my alter ego Alice Hatmaker make an appearance? Gracious, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have definitely need more of them then. I really yeah. want to know what Alice is like as a grown up. I, I hope. Yeah, I I'm not sure how she is. <laughs> Sure. It's hard to say. It's hard to hard say to how say. she would be. She'll be a little up and down. She'll be a little up and down. She'll be sure. Who mm -hmm. among us isn't under these circumstances? Honestly, it's true. It's true. Um, someone asked a question, which mm -hmm. is in the spirit of hope and goodwill. What good work do you think they're doing at the Tillerman House now? I. That's a mild, mild spoiler. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can elaborate on that if you'd like to, but I would also be curious to just have your thoughts on how all of the characters in this book are weathering the quarantine. <laughs> Who has started a podcast? <laughs> oh, well, uh, yeah. Dexter definitely started a podcast. It's just- What kind? And occasionally he has guests on and mm -hmm. like- a certain character who we shan't spoil just like pops into the background amusingly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I feel like the the first thing I would want the Tellerman um, team. Uh, team to really focus on is public education, public schools, like just pumping money and resources into that towards teachers, public public libraries, public schools. That's where the Tellerman Foundation would have focused. Nice. right now <laughs> mm -hmm. and and leading up to this time because that was where vince's heart was too mm -hmm. um so oh gosh um it's not tuesday's life is not that much different <laughs> <laughs> sure and works from home um mm -hmm. remotely and uh, um it doesn't see too many people dex is losing his mind quietly which is why he has i feel like dex in this time has like put together an entire media empire he has <laughs> yeah, like like maybe he's like making t-shirts and like selling them or doing something um dory is oh dory dory would would come over and socialize with tuesday that would be the yeah, yeah. in-person human contact that tuesday has <laughs> But yeah, I think they're they're like just like they're hurting. It's been a hard year for everyone, but they're hanging in there. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question from Bracket. We have two questions from Bracket, which is mm -hmm. as someone who has never lived in Boston, mm -hmm. where should we go when we can travel again? Uh you just broke up a little bit, Margaret. What was that? Uh, where should Bracket go when we can all travel again? If he can uh, come uh, if they can come to Boston. Oh, well. I mean, if you like Halloween, Salem is ridiculous in October. Yeah. And but like not in a classy way. It's like the Vegas of New England. So like, <laughs> like that, it's very that and it's really fun. Um, <laughs> so that's your thing. But also like I would say um, Martha's Vineyard is beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And and it's I mean, Nantucket's gorgeous too, but I like Martha's just has a little it's a little bigger and there's a little more variety. 
Um, my like, therapist says that the good people who summer on islands in Massachusetts are all the <laughs> Martha's Vineyard people. Martha's Vineyard people. <laughs> and the Nantucket people are the dicey ones. Well, I just remember walking through like the- No Nantucket. offense to anyone who summers yeah. in Nantucket. Exactly. You're lovely. You're lo it's a beautiful place, but I remember walking through it being like, oh, there's like a polo. Yeah. <laughs> in like your quaint little town. Okay. Um, but yeah, Martha's Vineyard has- it's got, um, I can't remember names of anything now, so, but it's got Egertown, Egertown. Um, mm -hmm. It has the lighthouse, it has the incredible tabernacle and all the gingerbread cottages, mm -hmm. um, lofts. It's just like, it's a little bit bigger and there's a little more to explore. Um, so yeah, Martha's Vineyard is absolutely beautiful. We have two questions about your influences. Mm -hmm. So one, is it also from Brackett, who would love to know what books you would recommend to us uh, because they love the way the Westin game maybe uh, was an influence. So there's that. And then there's another one that says you make so many fantastic pop culture references in the novel. Are there any you had to cut? And this one gives a shout out. Kayla gives a shout out to Danielle Mooney, who recommended the book to her. <laughs> and Danielle Mooney picked up the book on a whim just because the character had her last name and loved it. So oh, thank you, Danielle. Well, kiss me. the Moonies. Um, <laughs> so... The first question, books that are um, other other reads. I love P.D. James' The Skull Beneath the Skin, which is uh, the only, she's only wrote two books with um, her sort of um, amateur detective uh, woman character, Cordelia Gray. And it's, it, it's interesting because you can kind of see P.D. James in her later writing. She sort of uses other characters like Kate, uh, I forget what her last name is, but there's Kate character who kind of, she she writes, she sort of like takes up Cordelia's, the stuff that she's interested in writing about Cordelia, Kate gets to do and mm -hmm. Adam Doglish books. But um, Skull Beneath the Skin is just about like this party on an island at like a Victorian house and like someone gets murdered with like a marble baby's arm. It's just- I love all this shit. <laughs> it's wild. And- but it's also P.D. James, so it's very just, it's really well written. Um, I, I like that, it's a great mystery. Um, ooh, that's a good, what other like great mystery? I have a very high bar for like mystery books and adventure books. Oh, um, Catherine Neville's The Eight is The Trip. Yes, <laughs> my favorite, I, I really love that book. It, it came out like in the 80s, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's got a dual narrative and one is about a woman who I think is like a, she's like a software engineer or something. And she has, Ooh. she's on some kind of quest having to do with OPEC. There's some, something Middle Eastern <laughs> and there's like a dashing, like super hot Russian chess master that she gets involved with. And then the other is a historical story set during the French revolution about- I love, I yeah. love a dual, I love a dual present historical narrative. It's so great for me. <laughs> and that's about Charlemagne's enchanted chess set. And no. Damn, okay. Yeah, it's a great book. It's a great that's book. so in. Kate, um, have you read any Connie Willis? Yes, yes. I finally read To Say Nothing of the Dog. That was, was the one that I would recommend as well as, yeah. a, as, a, as a worthy compatriot for your novels. Thank you. Yeah, it's just very, I really enjoyed that book. Um, yeah. The question was, what was the other question? Um, The other question was, were there any pop culture references you had to cut? That you were, you were desolate about. I don't think so. I think I got everything in that I wanted in. <laughs> it was mostly just your Somerville takeout orders. It was to cut trimmed out. Takeout orders, yes. <laughs> um, I feel like like of all of the Boston, the Moominite Panic, that I got that in there, that is probably my proudest achievement because that's a real deep cut. Like people who know know, but everyone else Yeah, knows, the, the true heads know. The true heads know, but everybody else is fully lost. Else, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one to have gotten in there. Okay. We are on what I think is my final question. So if you folks have more that you want to throw in there, ask a question and we can we can add it to the queue. But my final question is, I would like you to tell me the team of five fictional characters you would have wanted to compete in this scavenger hunt with. And you can pick Tuesday, you can pick characters from your own books, but just... I was going to tell you this at the beginning and then give you the whole time to think about it, but now I'm just putting you on the spot. Oh my gosh, this is a really good, really, really good question. All right. Thank you. Uh, Turtle. Sure, Turtle. Turtle Please. Wexler. Turtle from Wexler from the Westing game. game. Classic. Um, adult Turtle. She's grown. She's grown. She's grown. I would love um, to read a book about Adult Turtle. Yes. I kind of think I did with Tuesday Mooney Speaks to Talks to Ghosts. Yeah. Uh, 
I would probably say Miss Marple because she would like, also be like super into it. Um, Miss Marple was one of my mom's nicknames for me when I was little because I was so observant. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I need someone who's. <laughs> <sighs> This is a tricky oh. one. Um, I'm trying to think of other characters. Like everyone, it would be a very lopsided team because it would be all like thinkers and no one who's like gonna just throw themselves physically into the fray. Right, right. <laughs> and like you need you need that sort of like balance. You need both. You need both. You need both. Um, hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me think a little bit. Let me think on that one a little bit. Okay. Yep. Um, to say nothing of the dog is getting a lot of well. Oh, it's a lot of love. two other people in the comments have said they love it. So that counts as a lot of love. Yeah. It's, um, love. it's actually very interesting because one of my other favorite books that like is under read is Bellwether by Connie Willis. Yeah. Yep. Spelled, oh, Sally Lockhart is fantastic. Oh, yes. Correct, unlikely story. And a doer. And a doer. Can we get Sally and Fred? Yes, we can get Sally and Fred. Oh, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll have to tell this story um for the folks who have not read these books there it's a series of uh mystery novels set in the victorian era uh with like a with like a scrappy female protagonist mm -hmm. written by philip pullman of golden yep. compass fame um and i'm gonna spoil something mildly for you which is there's this great love story between mm -hmm. sally who's this very feminist like active doer character and she like won't get married because victorian marriage laws are so oppressive um and then there's this like lovely photographer fred garland who's just like a sweet he's just like a great he's a man this is what i like to say i, I like henry chilney from northanger abbey because he's a man who knows his muslins and then that's just like a category and it's my category of like men who seem like they have big sisters men who just are comfortable being around women and feminine areas and like don't think it is beneath them and don't think it is not for them. They just mm -hmm. expand in that space. Fred is such a man who knows his muslin and they have this beautiful love story and then he dies very tragically. <laughs> and I certainly, <laughs> that book is both the first sex scene I ever read at age 10 at sleepaway camp. Yeah. And then very shortly after the sex scene happens, she absolutely dies. <laughs> I mean, there's a real like, like it's so good dramatically, and then it's so like, if you have sex, he will die. <laughs> Which I'm sure is not what Philip Pullman wanted me to take away from it, but I'm not saying it's not his fault. I didn't lose my virginity until I was 24. <laughs> You're welcome, everyone attending this book event for the yep. amount you now know about my life. Yes, it's the best. <laughs> I'm like with the two of you. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so Sally Lockhart and Fred, great picks. Although Jim, also a great pick. Also a great pick. Also and mm. doesn't die, so. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the death, but not the sex. There we go. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think depending on what age you were when you read it, the sex might not have seemed as consequential as it did to me at 10, <laughs> reading my first ever sex scene. <laughs> I was, and it's very explicit because she's like, "I'm going to have sex with you before we're engaged or married." Yep, it's a very. Let you know very that it is not about the Victorian social mores, which we're both subject to. It is about my love for you. <laughs> it's so good. Well, and Bracket and I are in the same boat with regards yeah. to this. <laughs> we have we have one more question that has come in. Um, oh. It, Bracket is still curious about places in Boston to visit. Oh, in Boston. And uh, someone did say the, the Gardner Museum, which yeah. is a very correct answer. And I would be curious. I'd love to see what you did with the Gardner heist. Oh, my gosh. As yeah. a focal point in subsequent books. I mean, I'm not going to say it's not not on my short list, but yeah, no, the Gardner Museum's incredible. I, I love the aquarium because penguins. I love penguins. Penguins, they're great penguins. And Good the, seals, and, too. And that cute, and the jellyfish and the big tank. Big in the tank, middle. big old tank. Great tank. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to think of some more kind of like off the beaten path. Isn't there? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all of the, all of the parks. I will say, yeah. I don't know that you made enough of the emerald necklace. No, I really didn't. I really didn't. Yeah. Uh, in this book, so that is something you should definitely consider revisiting because it is <laughs> it's a major feature. The Emerald Necklace, for those who don't know, Boston is a series of eight public parks in the greater Boston area, all designed by um, Frederick Law Olmsted, 
Yep. Who is responsible for Prospect and Central Park in New York? Lesser parks, but slightly more well known. <laughs> claim, and they're great. Claim. They're great. Uh, and in Franklin Park, there are particularly cool. There's the schoolhouse master, the schoolmaster hill ruins. Mm -hmm. Very evocative. Mm -hmm. um, just like the, the like a folly, except you know, deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> You know what else I really love? I really love Orchard House and Concord. Oh, also Mount Auburn Cemetery. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mount Auburn Cemetery is incredible. Yep. Mount Auburn Cemetery is the beginning of the pastoral cemetery movement in yep. the United States, which is prior to that, which is these cramped little graveyards, which is like everybody is jammed in and like all of the things on the gravestones are like skulls. Yep. Like maybe if it's a nice day, it's like skulls with wings. <laughs> but mostly it's just like skulls. It's like you are going to die and death is not fun. And then this was like, you're going to die, but you're going to go to the fields of Elysium. And yep. and, and we're going to talk about sheaves of wheat that are going to be sheaves of wheat all over everything. Because it's about the bounty of your life being harvested. Um, and it's these rolling hills and all of this, it's all of the beautiful. paths are like Halcyon Drive and like Hyacinth Way. It's wonderful. It's my favorite place to take people from out of town. We go for a walk in... Mount Auburn Cemetery, and then there's a really nice bakery oh. right next door, Safra Bakery. Oh, I remember places. Yeah, Safra, if you go on weekends, when you can travel again, they have a uh, tahini cream donut. Mm. That is the greatest thing I've eaten in my life. So Incredible. that's certainly what I would recommend. Yeah, yeah, any of the parks, any, I mean, like- the Boston Public Library is so beautiful oh, and yes. is featured prominently in the book. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I love the BPL. Just like walking around the courtyard. I remember there was, I spent a day there towards the end of my time at Boston and I knew like my moving date was coming. And I, I remember walking around the courtyard and being like, this is the last time I do this while I live here and like having a moment. <laughs> it's like, I, have, I have lots of moments. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have moments too, Kate. It does seem tragic that we realized this deep, deep bond after we stop sharing a city. This is, this is like my friend Gina D'Amico, the exact same thing. Like our parents, our, our fathers are both friends. They grew up together. She lived oh. in Boston for many years. And like, we didn't get to be friends until we were both leaving. So like. <laughs> some things, some bonds are meant to bloom in distance. Yeah. And I guess ours is just one of them. It's true. You have to finish your trivia. You have to finish, excuse me, your scavenger hunt team. Oh, Jason okay. did throw in, uh, Veronica Mars as an option. Oh, oh. Solid. The Maparium is also a great one. Ooh, Patricia, thank you for telling me there are spooky stories from Mount Auburn. I did not know that, and I clearly need to find them. <laughs> yes, please. Uh huh. Wait, so is that that's five people, right? So I said Miss Marple, Turtle, um, Fred, Fred and, and Sally. Fred and Sally. And I feel like. I feel like you might need more. I might, you might need like a, a researcher. I mean, mm. Tuesday. Jimmy? Tuesday. I think yeah. Tuesday could be your person. I was going to say maybe Giles from Buffy, but Tuesday. I mean, Tuesday, Tuesday's got her team. I want Giles. <laughs> <laughs> She's got her team. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, Brad recommends Jamaica Plain, which is where I live, which is yeah. the greatest neighborhood in the entire world. So I second it. Beautiful neighborhood. <laughs> I'm gonna see if we have any more. Nope, I think those are all yep. the questions. Right. We've touched upon them. Yes, this was so much fun. fun. This was so fun. Thank you so much, for oh my. So oh my God, Kim. My, my, my I've just been life. laughing the whole time. I have to keep muting myself, and then I forgot. <laughs> I was not muted when the eight by Catherine. Kim. Yes. Uh, but thank God you weren't muted. It was you added so much to the discussion. Oh, with, your, with, your, with your vibrant seconding. <laughs> it's a great book. It's a great book. I remember reading that oh, book. I, I just like lent, I borrowed it from a friend and was like, this looks fun. And it was like, oh my God. <laughs> I it. Like yeah. I have the my beat up old paperback and oh, it's so good. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So, okay. Whenever this is all over, Kate, you must come. Oh, I Margaret, you have to come yeah. too. And you'll all be on the stage here and we will make margaritas and or drink wine and do right. everything. That's when the pandemic is yeah. controlled and Kate has a sequel to Tuesday when he talks to ghosts to tour with, Absolutely. we know exactly where the best event is going to be. And it's going it's to right be like there. at an unlikely story. 
The likeliest story possible is the one we just told. <laughs> that was a blast, you guys. I cannot thank you enough. And it was so much uh, fun. Thank you. And you guys should all buy Tuesday Mooney because it seriously is like for me, it's like the eight Tuesday Mooney. There's like a few, you know, books that you kind of hang on to and go back like they're your friends. And oh, so thank you. That yeah. means I love it. I'm like, I want to hang out with Tuesday. <laughs> I, think I can safely say that if you enjoyed the type of conversation that just occurred, you will love Kate's books. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, thank you so much. Um, get your pleasure. Pleasure. click on the link below. We appreciate all of your support, everyone. And thank you for being with us this evening. Yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you so much. I had such a great time. Um, yay. Thrilled, Kate. Anytime. Yeah. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> all right. Bye, Bye. guys. Bye.